Welcome to The Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. The Cognitive Crucible is a forum that presents different perspectives and emerging thought leadership related to the information environment. The opinions expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of or endorsement by the Information Professionals Association. My guest today on the Cognitive Crucible is Nicholas Eberstadt, who holds the Henry Wendt Chair in Political Economy at the American Enterprise Institute, where he researches and writes extensively on demographics and economic development generally, and more specifically on international security in the Korean Peninsula and Asia. Domestically, he focuses on poverty and social well-being. Dr. Eberstadt is also a senior advisor to the National Bureau of Asian Research. Nicholas Eberstadt, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, by the way, before we get started, Nicholas, uh, a big shout out to one of our listeners, Karen Monahan, who uh, introduced us a few days ago. She heard one of our recent discussions with Matthew Canham, and um, uh, in that uh, discussion, Matthew Canham mentioned uh, uh, China's demographic challenges, and uh, she connected us up uh, based based on uh, based off of that comment. So a big thank you to Karen for that. And so the, the conversation I'd like to have with you today, Nicholas, will cover demographics and national security and economic implications, um, especially for the US, Russia, China, and we may touch on some other uh, aspects of demographics challenges facing other uh, areas of the world too. But before we get into these topics, could we please start by getting your just kind of like a very broad comment on uh, you know global affairs or the strategic landscape today? Um, we've been uh, we've been in a prolonged period uh, that's lasted for decades, which um, could be uncharitably described as a sort of a fool's paradise. Um, it's also known as the post Cold War era, which lasted from more or less the be it began when uh, the Berlin Wall fell and the Soviet Union collapsed, and I'd say it more or less ended when uh, the Kremlin invaded Ukraine last year. Because of the extraordinary and historically unprecedented surfeit of U.S. power during those decades, um, a lot of illusions uh, were possible. Uh, some people believed that uh, we'd reach a new era in which a uh, great power conflict was no longer likely. Uh, others thought we'd reached a sort of, we were heading towards a kind of Davos world. Uh, we also had, uh, for much of that period, uh, a central bank approach, which was providing lenders more or less with free money. Um, I think all of these illusions uh, die, will die, but they will die hard. I see. Okay. Um, great perspective there. Um, so relative to demographics, I, I'd like to maybe ask a couple of uh, 101 or, you know, intro questions sure. <laughs> regarding uh, de demographics. And then, uh, as I mentioned, we can step into some specific challenges that are being faced uh, by uh, a, a few different areas of the world. So uh, de demographics, uh, fascinating topic, but how, how do you tend to introduce the topic of demographics to an audience that might not have given the issue a whole lot of thought. Sure. Well, um, depending upon how wide you draw the uh, uh, draw the remit, I mean, demographics can be everything about all people, which gives you a pretty big, uh, which yeah. gives you a pretty big stage. Or you can kind of narrow it to looking at the uh, 
changes in numbers and uh, composition and the reasons for the changes in numbers and composition of different groups or countries or regions. Uh, I would say that in general, when we are not talking about catastrophic events, populations tend to change kind of gradually, certainly gradually for our, you know, 24-7 news cycle, they change pretty gradually in comparison mm. to that. Um, but they also change pretty unforgivingly. Uh, so they alter the realm of the possible gradually. I'm not a demography is destiny boy. I think that human agency is absolutely crucial to appreciate. But the the broad changes over the course of a generation or two in population numbers can really alter the security landscape pretty dramatically. I see. And yeah, I, I wanted to ask you about that common phrase that I've heard, uh, demographics is destiny. And you yep. said that you generally don't subscribe to that. What, what is it that you think people are trying to convey when they say that demographics is destiny and, and and why do you tend to challenge that well the phrase it's a fabulous phrase i mean yeah, it's a it, it is it's very it's very catchy you know it's very catchy yeah it is attributed i'm not sure if it's accurately attributed but it is widely attributed to a french polymath from the 1800s uh and uh, named Auguste Comte. Now, Auguste was quite a braino, uh, but on the other hand, he was a socialist and he was a Frenchman, and I'm neither of those things. And so my kind of American perspective on that aphorism is that it, uh, it kind of promises too much and delivers too little. I mean, if you say that demography is destiny, well, yeah, sure. Let's, you know, stick around and wait a couple of million years and, and you'll be right. <laughs> but in the meanwhile, kind of like, uh, kind of, kind of like in, in, in the long run, we're all dead. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. uh, sure. I mean, if you, uh, I mean, you can make it unfalsifiable, but if you, um, if you try to make it into anything that's kind of uh, practicable, you know, that's kind of like gives you some instruments for looking at something. Um, it, it, it's it's a lot mushier. It's a lot mushier. That's why I, I see why I like to look at the way that things change. Uh, you know, things. There are two different types of uh, population change, as I mentioned. There's the sort of stuff that happens gradually with, let's say, uh, orderly progress, and then there's a sort of terrible jolts that happen. You know, when the four horsemen get involved. You know, when with when there's a famine or a war or a plague or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, in our modern world, we've kind of um, uh, we have at least we have, if not conquered, we have postponed the four horsemen, so that we've got pretty normal, regular, gradual rhythms, even when birth rates are dropping a lot over time, mm. even when populations are aging. So I think that one can one can look at this. And actually, one of the nice things about population studies or demography is that more than economics or political science or technology, you have a pretty good impression of what the world is going to world's going to look like or the future is going to look like you know 10 15 even 20 years from now because the overwhelming majority of people who are going to be in that future world are already alive today mm, right yeah okay excellent all right so uh maybe we can start uh uh getting your uh perspective for a couple of different countries sure. of, of interest and we'll kind of just take them one at a time uh but so could could we start with china please and uh you just give us a download on you know where china has been where it is and where where you think it's going and why uh demographically super i'll before i uh, before i talk about china let mm -hmm. me give, let me um offer a thumbnail history of world population because that's going to put china and other countries we talk about in dynamite perspective yeah dynamite so, 
between um, between the beginning of the 20th century and today, the world's population has risen by a factor of more than five. So there have never been as many people living on the world as like right now while we're talking. Um, but the this population explosion didn't occur because people suddenly started breeding like rabbits. It happened because we finally stopped dying like flies. Between, uh, let's say, 1900 and 2023, uh, humanity's life expectancy at birth probably went from something like about 30 years to the current 70 plus, maybe 73 years. That's like the global average now. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a fantastic achievement. It's We've had this health explosion and it's entirely the health explosion that has been responsible for the increase in human numbers. Now, um, by way of background, you know, if you're going to have a population problem, I'll pick a health explosion anytime. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, mm -hmm. it, it improves lives. It gives you other opportunities. You may not use them well, but it's an awful lot better than <laughs> just about anything else I can think of. Right, um, and and there's a there's a direct correlation, is there not, between that uh, longevity health explosion and a uh, reduction in global poverty? Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, education, nutrition, all sorts of good things. Um, you know, so that's so that's the big background engine that's uh, changed our population contours uh, over the last century plus. Now, since the end of World War II, something else has been happening. And this is a global march towards below replacement fertility towards uh, childbearing patterns, which if continued would uh, uh, lead, wouldn't be able to maintain population stability without, um, uh, you know, without immigration. So at this point, like while we're talking uh, today, uh, about three quarters of the people in the world live in below replacement fertility countries. So it's it's gone an awful long way beyond rich countries. Most mm -hmm. of the people who live in below replacement fertility, sub replacement countries live in low income societies. So three things happen, and I'm gonna, and these are happening in China, Russia. You know, we'll talk mm -hmm. about, but they're mm -hmm. hap they're happening differentially. But three things happen with below replacement fertility. First thing is after a while, your workforce totals peak and then go down indefinitely as far as the demographer's eye can see. A little bit later on, the same thing happens to your total national population headcount. The third thing that happens is um, a little bit counterintuitive. Small families make for gray societies. When I got into this stuff, uh, it was very hard for me to wrap my head around that one. I figured that it was long lives that would make for old, gray populations. But if you think of it, you squeeze the base of a population pyramid and then, you know, a higher share of the, you know, people are older. So this these two waves are washing through the world, but you know with different speed and uh, severity, and that's what we're seeing kind of play out in China, Russia, and other places we're going to talk about. Now let's get to China. So China had um, this extraordinary explosion of economic growth. Uh, from the death of Mao until, you know, just a few years ago. And nothing like that had ever happened before in recorded uh, economic history. Nothing that fast, nothing that long, certainly not for the world's most populous country. Mm -hmm. and there, there were a lot of demographic, you know, tailwinds there. Um, but... All of those demographic tailwinds are now headwinds, and I'll describe what I mean. Because, uh, because in part uh, of the awful coercive one-child policy, China's uh, fertility levels have been way below replacement for more than a generation since mm -hmm. uh, since at least the early 1990s, let's say, um, and. Um, this has 
meant, for example, that working age population peaked in China about 10 years ago and is now declining. Well, for the first, for the generation and more of absolutely spectacular, heroic economic growth, China's labor force was rising in numbers. And because there was an underutilization of uh, workforce at the death of Mao, the number of working hours were growing even faster than the working age population. Well, we're on the downside of the roller coaster now. So that's one thing that's slowing stuff down. Another thing is <clears throat> the uh, radical aging of the population. Um, no country in the world uh, has ever gone gray faster than China is doing it now. Mm. Uh, Japan kind of tracked. Japan would be the comparator. But Japan in a previous day was, you know, got rich before it got old, and China's doing it the other way around, which is a whole lot less fun. There are mm. two other things I'll mention as well um, with China's demographic outlook. Um, one is the imbalance between um, baby boys and baby girls that came to light during the one child policy era um because there seemed there was mass female feticide for reasons we could discuss but because because of that there was a surfeit of baby boys well those baby boys are now you know young men looking for brides and there's a marriage squeeze going on in china there are going to be tens of millions of young men who aren't going to be able to um to match up with the number of uh, counterpart women the same age. And this is kind of like a, uh, what would you call it? This is the science fiction portion of the program because we don't know exactly what that's going to do. Maybe it'll- it, it's a, uh, it, it sounds like uh, minimally, it has destabilizing potential, I would think. Well, it certainly could. I mean, it may be that this is uh -huh. all kind of like lives of quiet desperation and people die, you know, kind of like lonely deaths. Mm -hmm. It could be destabilizing, as you're saying. When I look at it, I, I kind of think of it as uh, if you were an insurance company, you know, how much would you want to charge for the policy to cover this risk? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. But I, I don't know what's going to happen. We can stay tuned, but it could be a wild card. But the fourth thing I think is actually bigger than any of the items I've ticked off for you so far. And this is the collapse of the extended family in China. Mm. You can, you, I mean, you can imagine if you have, um, if you have only children begetting only children, you get this famous four to one family structure where you've got four grandparents, two parents and one child. But what emerges from that? Um, you know, in that extreme, you get a world where there are no siblings, no cousins, no uncles, no aunts, only ancestors, and maybe someday descendants. Well, I mean, the glue everywhere, you know, all around the world uh, in societies is the family unit. And China's, uh, you know, China's extended family structure is you know, famously important in their society and even in their civilization for being the... Um, uh, the safety net for people when times are bad and mm -hmm. the, kind of the springboard for them when opportunity beckons. Uh, how future China is going to perform when this social capital kind of like evaporates is a really big question. Mm -hmm. And it's one, strangely enough, that the CCP has hardly asked about at all which suggests to me that this may come as a sort of a strategic surprise and that they may not, they, they may be less prepared to deal with this than you'd expect. Because they've got very good demographers in China. The government uh, tasks them with doing all sorts of different studies, but because family structure is not on the radar screen, they're not asking about that. Mm -hmm. And your 
colleague there at AEI, Nicholas um, Yuval Levin, uh, he, he was a guest on, on the podcast a year or so ago, and uh, we, we talked about institutions and the importance of institutions in uh, society. And uh, he, he pointed out that the family, at least in, in his formulation, is the uh, the original institution or, or certainly one of the original institutions. And as you were just commenting, if uh, the, the historical notion of the family is changing, not only in China, but maybe in other areas of the world too, then that's, um, you know, that's, that's going into uncharted waters for, you know, what it means to be a human and um, uh, exist in society. Oh, absolutely. It, it is happening everywhere. Um, and it's happening uh, very, um, uh, very acutely in the rest of East Asia. I mean, for example, uh, demographers from Japan have uh, done the done this work, not me, I'm just citing it. But uh, there are projections for Japan that on current trajectories, um, a woman born in 1990, who's what, that's 33 now, uh, is slightly more likely than not to have no grandchildren, no biological grandchildren during the course of her life. Mm -hmm. So think of what that sort of a world looks like, right? I mean, that's a, a phenomenal change from uh, everything that we take kind of for granted. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, about 40% of those notional women would end up without any kids and a little over half would end up with no biological grandkids. So, uh, you know, so who looks after Japan's, um, you know, healthy, isolate, uh, you know, seniors in the generation uh, ahead? Uh, I don't know how good, you know, I don't know how good pet rocks or, uh, you know, artificial, mm -hmm. uh, it, artificially intelligent robots are going to be at that. I've got a feeling that social policy uh, isn't going to be that good and it's going to be real expensive. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So you, you don't have to put a, um, uh, you know, some kind of a label on it, good or bad, right or wrong, uh, but it's happening and it, it, it needs to be, uh, uh, it needs Taking to be made. Yeah, it needs to be made part of the calculus going yeah, forward. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. All right. Okay. Well, uh, that is a, a, a very brief recap of, of what's happening in, in China. And so thank you for that. So maybe we could do the same with uh, Russia. And what sure. I, uh, as I mentioned, I heard you talking in another uh, uh, forum about Russia. And, and one thing that stood out to me was you, you said that one of Russia's uh, major challenges relative to demography is uh, a, a brain drain. So may, may, maybe you could hit, hit on that, sure. little, that point as well as you're talking about Russia. Yeah, you bet. Well, um, the Russian Federation's demographic vulnerabilities really trace back to the Soviet era. Um, one of the uh, one of the things you'll see again and again in demographic studies is this kind of like long reach of the past, right? Because mm -hmm. people be born, you know, 70 years ago, and some of the things that happened back then still you know, kind of like travel with them, if you want to put it that way. So in the 1960s, uh, in the Soviet Union, um, death rates for working age men started to go up. And that seemed very odd and maybe, uh, you know, kind of like a statistical artifact. But then death rates for working age women started to go up. And then death rates for infants started to go up. And the Kremlin um, stopped publishing statistics on this stuff. So we knew that it was true, right? <laughs> and mm -hmm. so, so a, a health crisis emerged in the Soviet times with life expectancy stagnating or even declining uh, for the national population. And I had assumed that when communism uh, ended in the 1990s, that this would be the end of that problem for the Russian Federation. I was totally wrong. Um, 
the problem became more acute in the 1990s. Uh, life expectancy for men dropped into the 50s then, uh, you know, to give you a, that's 20 years lower than U.S. male life expectancy. I mean, it's, a, it's, mm. it's very low. Um, there's been some recovery, but um, in, uh, in the latest numbers from the World Health Organization, uh, bef just before the COVID pandemic, life expectancy for a 15-year-old guy in Russia was about the same as in the country of Haiti, okay? Haiti. Mm. So it's unfair to say that there is a, you know, Russia's got a third world health problem because that would be unfair to the third world. Haiti is more like fourth world. So there's, there's acutely high mortality, especially for working age men, uh, due not to um, diseases of, poverty and malnutrition and you know contagion but from injuries and premature death from heart disease so there's this tremendous health problem in russia lots of education but very little or surprisingly little human capital surprisingly little uh, health surprisingly little knowledge creation uh, at the same time that this syndrome continues uh, Russia's birth levels remain far below the replacement rate, uh, despite the Kremlin's uh, quite expensive pronatal policies. Uh, the maybe birth levels recently are thirty percent below replacement, which would mean that each generation you know, absent immigration would be like 30% smaller than the generation before. Russia has been depopulating since the 1990s. Uh, annexing other people's territories is one way of trying to cope with population decline, I suppose. Um, but then in addition, now we have the war. So there are a couple of other things going on there. We've got the casualties from the war. We've got the disruption of families uh, from the um, conscription. And we've got uh, a, a critical number of smart, skilled, talented professionals leaving the country because they want no part of this and they don't like mm. the looks of the dark, new, kind of uh, even more oppressive uh atmosphere that's coming for people like them so we're all familiar with the big you know forced migration out of ukraine due to the invasion but there's a second stream of migrants that this war has triggered and those are highly talented uh people from russia getting out of the country maybe for good well, that's a, a, a loss for uh, Russia, but uh, presumably a gain for other areas of the world where, where they're going to. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, um, uh, just in it. it, it Lots more that can be said there, I'm sure, uh, but in the interest of, of just kind of covering the territory, I know that you also have uh, uh, a lot to say about what's happening within the United States and uh, some demographic forces that we need to sit up and pay attention to. Sure. Well, <clears throat> um, compared to any other large country, the... Um, demographic profile for the United States of America is extremely favorable, uh, extremely favorable. Um, we have tremendous human resources. Um, we have a, uh, a cadre of highly educated, um, highly skilled professionals uh, that uh, you know, is a vast in size. Um, our population structure is much, um, to my way of thinking, much more favorable than um, other large areas, unlike China, unlike, um, unlike 
Europe, unlike Japan, unlike Russia, uh, we have more births than deaths every year. Um, we are we have a relative for a rich country. We have a relatively youthful population structure. Um, we can expect uh, continuing modest population growth in the decades immediately ahead. And importantly, we we seem to be a, a talent magnet for people from all over the world who come mm. to the country. Now, mm -hmm. this isn't because we've got this genius immigration program. I mean, our immigration system is completely broken and chaotic. It's despite ourselves that mm. we seem to be such an attractive venue for uh, people. And the talent, um, the talent goes all the way from, uh, you know, from the very, from inventors, from accredited inventors, the giant sucking sound that you hear is people from all over the world who are great inventors coming to the USA, um, down to people who don't have any degrees, but who've got a lot of grit and determination and motivation and want to make something of themselves and give a future to their kids. So we've got that going for us as well. Now, Recently, we've had a pretty bad patch during this uh, post-Cold War era that I was uh, mentioning mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. um, we, have, we have a phenomenon or a couple of phenomenon that I've grouped together under something that I would call the new misery, which we see in the United States. I mean, some of this is the deaths of despair, the, you know, the um, opioid problems, uh, the suicide problems, our our health progress got stuck and uh, our even before the uh, COVID calamity, which is a kind of a one off, but even before the COVID calamity, our life expectancy at birth as a country was only creeping up. Uh, others were passing us. Uh, we have a we have a significant problem with uh, work for prime age men, our um, our prime age men uh, have the same employment levels or you know, employment to population ratio today as at the end of the Great Depression. And that's a serious long-term problem. So I don't want to um, I don't want to sound like Pollyanna about the United States, but mm -hmm. if you put everything in internet in if you compare to other real existing places, uh, there's no other team that's got a more favorable um, human resource outlook than the U.S., despite all of these new flaws. I see. I see. Um, uh, before I ask you, you know, some, I guess, broader questions about like national security implications for, for all of this, are, are there any other areas of the world uh, in, in, in the brief time that we have, Nicholas, that yeah. you'd like to highlight that that also have interesting demographic dynamics happening sure well I, i'd mention one in uh, mention one in particular which is i know that many people are interested in security in the greater middle east uh and uh, for a lot of the uh a lot of the past decades there's been a lot of discussion about youth bulges in the middle east uh, and social stability uh, due to uh, social security strain, uh, social stability strains uh, due to demographic changes. The most fascinating and unremarked phenomena in the modern world is the plummeting birth rates in the Ummah, you know, in the broadly construed Islamic global community. Um, there are a lot of places now within this greater Muslim world where birth levels are below replacement or far below replacement. Take, for example, Iran. Iran's birth level in its capital in Tehran is about the same as in like Zurich, Switzerland. I mean, it's far below replacement. The national mm -hmm. level is far below replacement. Turkey is below replacement. Uh, Lebanon is below replacement. Tunisia is below replacement. Uh, Bangladesh 
mm. in, in, mm. outside, but in the, in the Muslim world, but outside of the Middle East, below replacement. Indonesia is on the cusp of falling below replacement. Now, one of the interesting things here is that uh, most of the well, more big, fast drops in fertility have occurred in Muslim majority countries than in any other part of the world. And this is happening in the main without rapid socioeconomic modernization. And what this means is that in, you know, in a demographer's eye, in the next generation, mm -hmm. we're going to have gray populations, not youth bulges. Those youths are going to be old folks. Um, we're going to have gray populations with a lot of, you know, with a lot of um, chronic diseases on low income levels mm. in the greater Middle East and in some other places. And that's going to be the population problem uh, to come in a lot of the Muslim world. Mm. My goodness. All right. Well, uh, fascinating uh, whirlwind uh, tour of uh, global uh, demographic dynamics. Uh, fascinating stuff. So it, it, it seems to me that uh, uh, demographics and great power ambitions are linked, right? Uh, and, and something else that I've just been kind of thinking about is, uh, uh, you know, w one of the very best ways to compete globally, and that's something that, you know, we are talking about more and more is like, you know, competition and great power competition is uh, to effectively harness the human resources and the human ingenuity that is uh, latent within a population. Uh, what What are your thoughts about you know really really leaning into and tapping into uh, human ingenuity as a competitive advantage? Oh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I think I think that's absolutely uh, that's absolutely the promising uh, approach towards the future. I mean, we've got. You know, uh, the old Malthusian idea that um, we were going to be losing a global race between food and mouths, I think, has been decisively disproven. The the uh, the World Obesity Institute has just come out with a study saying that uh, it, within twenty years the majority of people in the world are going to be overweight. <laughs> I mean, that tell, tells you something mm -hmm. about the race between food and mouths, right? Yeah. Uh, but yeah. more more importantly, there's there's so much talent to be unlocked in each human being. There's prosperity and productivity and wealth and well-being that can be unlocked in the human potential. Now, there are a couple of things which uh, which we need to pay attention to because this can happen spontaneously, but it doesn't necessarily happen spontaneously. Um, for human uh, for humans to flourish, uh, health is important education and skills are important. I mean, an education that gives you more than a diploma, that gives you some knowledge mm -hmm. and skills are kind mm -hmm. of important. And a, a framework, uh, a let's call it a climate, a business atmosphere, which allows people to um, profit from their own endeavors. All of the all of these things matter. We've done a fantastic job historically, uh, in unlocking the value of uh, human resources over the course of the 20th century, uh, I mentioned that uh, I mentioned that the world's population increased by a factor of five. The world's output increased by a factor of 30. Um, world may seem poor today, but it's six times as rich as it was in 1900, and we seem to have a formula for defeating um, material poverty. There are a lot of other things we don't have a formula for, like finding meaning in our lives or banishing loneliness. But mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, you know, in terms of our material challenges, um, our human resource, our approach to, we have a good idea of what we need to do with human resources. Mm, right. And as you're describing, there's uh, a lot that goes into nurturing 
the human resources or, you know, uh, setting the conditions for success, uh, every, everything from um, honoring, uh, recognizing that these demographic shifts are happening, that there are these, you know, challenges. We'll just, I'll just stick within the United States, but challenges within the United States, as you were talking about the, you know, the uh, phenomenon that we're, we're observing with working aged men, but then also, uh, having this human supply chain of, uh, with, with, with appropriate education. So there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff that has to be, uh, happening in order to set the conditions for a uh, success, would you say? Absolutely. Absolutely. And <clears throat> we can, um, we can increase the odds of success by through thinking ahead about practical approaches to policy and uh, also to but but obviously government only has uh, has a small role in the greater flourishing of, uh, of people in our country mm -hmm. and elsewhere. Uh, a lot of things come from Yuval's other institutions from your conversation with him from social institutions including the family including businesses including communities uh they can be more healthy and propitious or less so and um you know we like we like to see things that are you know working in a sort of a copacetic manner right right well um you've been very generous with your time nicholas really appreciate it i, I like to ask a couple of uh wrap-up questions sure. Typ typically uh the, the first one is um what is a good research topic that a an interested student who's listening to this podcast might uh examine that's perhaps related to some of these things that we're talking about i think that one of the most interesting topics is the long-term availability of natural resources. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a paradox. Uh, the, more, uh, the more people there are in the world, the higher the world's uh, level of output, which is to say human demand, the lower the uh, inflation-adjusted price of natural resources seems to be. So, that certainly doesn't comport with the Malthusian view of the world. So, what's behind this? What's the, what's the uh, what's the answer for this? Hmm. Fascinating question. Uh, it, I heard another gentleman talking um, not too long ago. I I think it was on the Econ Talk podcast mm -hmm. with Russ Roberts, but mm -hmm. he 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 and his colleagues ran the numbers and for for western societies or maybe it was for the united states in particular uh that curiously uh today we are uh we have a higher quality of life and a higher gdp but curiously uh, the amount of waste that we're producing uh on average is less Do, do you know what I'm referring to there? Yeah, that... sure. Well, <clears throat> because part of part of the economizing process um, that makes for productivity and efficiency is uh, is eliminating or minimizing waste. Waste is expensive. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, fascinating uh, topic to uh, uh, study more. And then finally. Uh, a, a, a good book that you could suggest to our audience that that may or may not be related to the kinds of things that that we're talking about um this is a little bit uh this is a little bit off the wall okay um, but one of the reasons i'm suggesting something off the wall is that when you look at the future our imaginations are lacking you know the the, the, we see things that change in real life that are much more dramatic than our imaginations uh, would have imagined. And so good imagination kind of helps. Um, this is a this is an um, this is a science fiction trilogy from a writer in China. It's called the Three Body Problem. 
Uh, it is the most imaginative, um, uh, it's the most imaginative contribution I've come across uh, myself in the 21st century. And it comes from China, uh, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, a kind of a suffocating autocracy these days. Um, in addition to the imagination that's shown in this, uh, you know, depiction of an interstellar war, the author's depiction of China is um, so grim and so unvarnished that you realize that only a science fiction writer in a kind of a closed society like that can actually write about his own country today. Okay. Wow. Excellent suggestion. And uh, uh, encourage our listeners to check that out. And uh, with that, Nicholas Eberstadt, thank you so much for being a guest on The Cognitive Crucible. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure for me. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.